Thank you. And I, I want to begin by thanking Sheila Goldberg, Barbara Miller, and Martin Brower for inviting me to speak tonight and to say how delighted I am to be here. And that I'm also very impressed with what um, the Bethel congregation has done um, in the way of anti-racist work. So I want to discuss a few aspects of our journey towards an anti-racist museum. Um, and um, as Barbara said, we can stop for questions between them or if questions pop up in the chat during them, very freewheeling about it. Um, I'm gonna talk about the history of our journey, both the, um, the immediate history of how we started this work and have been carrying it out, as well as the history of the Fleming, which is very important um, to this story. I'm gonna talk about how it changed the way we work very profoundly. And I wanna share with you some of the outcomes of our work so far. And these take the form of exhibitions um, and a very important statement that we have now shared with the world. Um, and then lastly, I wanna talk about the responses that we have received to the work that we've done so far. So um, as with um, the congregation's um, anti-racist group, and I think a lot of other predominantly white institutions in this country, our work also began the day after George Floyd was murdered in Minneapolis, um, May 26, 2020, uh, was the day that we began the work. And um, like many white Americans, we were devastated as we had been with other prior murders of, of black men and women at the hands of police but this one happened um, shortly after the you know the curtain fell with the pandemic and our lives kind of came to a screeching halt um, and that just you know unforgettable nine minute uh, video that was made by um, Darnella Frazier and it really um, had the effect of making a lot of white Americans unable to turn away um, from racism in America and really felt the urgency of, of dealing with it. So before I talk about our dynamic in embarking on the work, I wanna talk a little bit about the history of the Fleming. Like a lot of museums that started when we did, a lot of late 19th, early 20th century museums, with global collections. Um, uh, the Fleming began in, it was opened in 1931. But um, many museums like ours were, were started, were founded by white citizens of our community. But the collections were really the result of European, um, Europeans in Africa and other colonies and Americans in the West and the colonialist practice of taking objects from their original cultures and often through violent means. So I wanna tell you two short, short stories about um, Fleming history that really form the backdrop um, to, in, in many ways, to our anti-racist work. And the first, um, the first one has to do with our collection of Native American art. So UVM, University of Vermont started collecting in the 1820s. The Fleming didn't open to house the collections until over a century later in 1931. Um, and one of the first major collections that came in was the Ogden Reed collection of Plains Indian artifacts. Um, this came about because a UVM alum named Ogden Reed was um, working for the government, forcing Native Americans, primarily Sioux, um, and other Plains uh, tribal groups onto reservations. They were destroying their culture and destroying individuals, destroying people and destroying their culture and gathering artifacts as they went, literally. So um, this collection formed the core of what became the anthropological collection of UVM and later of the Fleming Museum. The other story that I want to share with you, which um, is fairly unbelievable. Um, and I, I should say that a lot of museums of this era have similar stories, but I have always felt that ours are kind of particularly brutal. Um, the first director of the Fleming Museum from 1931 for the following 25 years 
was a biologist at the University of Vermont, and he was also the founder of the Eugenics Survey of Vermont. So I think many of you are familiar with the eugenics movement in the UK, Europe, and America, the 20s and 30s, but it was essentially an attempt to improve the human species by encouraging selective um, reproduction among what were considered people with desirable hereditary traits and discouraging those that had what they considered undesirable traits. So one of, the, um, one of the means by which the latter was carried out in this country was through um, legalized forced sterilization. This happened in Vermont and 26 other states. And um, I should mention that I'm sure a lot of you know as well that the minute that um, eugenics was picked up by the Third Reich, it ended in this country. But, um, from the, really the first quarter century of collecting, just to switch back to the museum, was done through the lens of eugenics. So the director was, you know, was leading the, a, a very major branch of eugenics in the um, effort you know, in, in Vermont and collecting objects from around the world through what was very clearly a racist hierarchical lens. So what were known, what was known as the ethnographic collections at the time were artifacts that were made uh, belonging to the, to the Fleming were made by people of color around the world. And these were pieces that were taken, mostly stolen by missionaries, by colonial officers, by diplomats, by soldiers and by others um, during colonial campaigns. And again, often accompanied by violence and usually without any knowledge of the culture from which they were taken and certainly no interest in it. They were interested in de literally destroying those cultures, not in appreciating them. Um, the fine arts collection of the Fleming, which started shortly after that uh, in, the, in the, well, at the same time as the Native American collection was being formed in the 1880s, um, prior to the, to the founding of the Fleming, the fine art collection was 90 something percent um, white artists and probably only slightly less um, percentage male artists. And that really only began to change in the 60s and 70s. And then lastly, the last segment of the Fleming collection was actually called the Colonial Collection. And this was decorative arts of white Vermonters that were given. So a lot of these things were given to the Fleming. Some were purchased by the director and his curator. Not surprisingly, <clears throat> the Fleming audiences over the years have been predominantly white. So with this historical backdrop, um, and the arrival of the pandemic, and then followed closely by the murder of George Floyd, it really set the stage for me, for my museum staff and I to feel a, a really serious urgency to finally turn our full attention to engaging the racist and colonialist, colonialist past of the Fleming and their ongoing legacies. And I'll talk about that momentarily. Um, and as I said, there really was a, a felt urgency to take this on. So the process was organic. Um, the, the staff is small, it's nine people, me and eight. Um, all but one are white. And one of us, one of, one of my white staff members had experience with engaging anti-racist work in museums. She had worked at the Art Institute of Chicago. And um, for years, they had weekly conversations in the education department. I don't think it was across the entire staff, um, but this work frequently starts in the education departments of museums. So um, we just began talking on, you know, on that day one. Um, I did not lead this as director. It really, when I, you know, when I talked about organically, it really rose out of the staff. We all took part in it very non-hierarchically. Um, it began very personally. We shared our own histories vis-a-vis um, -vis race, both personally and professionally. And then we, um, you know, we began to do our own reading as I'm sure you, you know, your group has as well. Um, we met twice a week as a full staff to talk about 
if and how it would be possible to transform the museum from its colonialist framework um, into an uh, anti-racist museum, a museum that's comfortable and welcomed for everybody. Um, and, and furthermore, to do it in a museum in a university that had a parent institution, which added a layer of complexity to it. We are not as autonomous as an independent, you know, city museum. So um, it was difficult work. It was emotional work. Um, we did it without a facilitator. We were very supportive of each other, but it was ferociously challenging. Um, it was it was rewarding and gratifying, and then there were days when you know we felt like we couldn't do it anymore. Sometimes we took a, a short break, but in the process, we confronted the fact that ninety years after the opening of the, of the museum, the legacy of the museum is really still I call it kind of baked into everything that we do. The way the permanent collection is organized, the way the collections are displayed. Our collection, our you know, our ongoing focus in collecting, our cultural programming, and even activities for children. When you dig down, not very far, everything we did remained within the framework of colonialism. And in the process, we realized that what we what we actually needed to do was was really to just kind of slow down and stop what we had been doing and stop what the Fleming had been doing essentially for 90 years. So um, we were really able to do that only because of the pandemic. Um, you know, we should, when we closed, we closed to the, the public and the university. And there we were with this happening and time to really think about it. Um, the first thing we did, we closed the music, we closed the exhibitions that we had open because we had to. Um, and we stopped what we call the exhibition mill which is one show after another um, in order to really figure out our path, <clears throat> our path forward. I want to mention one other factor here um, that also really came into play in, in terms of our sense of urgency, um, which, was, which is the changing demographic of the Burlington area. So Vermont is still the second whitest state in the country after only after Maine. Um, but Burlington and neighboring communities have become significantly more diverse as a result of 30 years now of the Vermont Refugee Resettlement Program, which is based in Burlington and adjacent Winooski. And then to a lesser extent, you, the University of Vermont's efforts to diversify um, faculty, staff, and students, which has been not as robust as, as they slash we would like, um, but it has made a difference. So the process of talking and you know beginning to think about how we might go about doing this um, unfolded over a period of six months until we really felt that we had done enough work internally to be ready to create something to share with the public that really helped the public see what um, you know the work that we were doing. And the first thing that we did. Um, was an exhibition titled Reckonings. And I think this is the, the specifically the show that Sheila saw when she was in Burlington. It was called Reckonings, Fleming Staff Reflect on the Collection and Our Current Moment. Um, and we did this in the fall of 2020, and it took a very, very different form than any, any show that we had done in the past. So one of the things that we wanted to do in general was to depart from the singular curatorial voice. And um, this, is, this is something that is the case throughout, you know, throughout museums. The curator is really on a pedestal. The curator is seen as the voice of the institution, not public relations, not, to, not fundraising, but the content provider. Um, there is only usually, I mean, in a small museum like mine, there is only one curator, and that is what we had, was a curator of exhibitions and collections. So um, most of the exhibitions in the past, it was her words on the labels on the wall. It was her concept. It was her curatorial work. So we wanted to depart from this 
We wanted to engage in what, in essentially the kind of collective trauma that the country was facing. We wanted to include emotion and personal perspective in our labels instead of the kind of objectivity or false objectivity and anonymity that is characteristic of museum labels where it is this anonymous voice um, and, you know, and uh, it is it supposedly objective perspective. So the entire Fleming staff and our student employees, uh, we each chose works from the collection that spoke to us individually about our time. We each wrote labels for them and our name went at the bottom with our title. So you, it was somebody's thinking. It wasn't this anonymous museum, know all museum voice. And then um, we edited one another's work and this was a very, very difficult process. Um, but again, it was, it was so worth it. And um, you know, this took months to do this, but um, we were delighted with it in the end. And we felt that um, it really did reflect our, how far our work had evolved or where our work had gotten to. Um, all of the staff was involved in the curatorial work and the labor, label writing we were no longer kind of siloed into our own departments. We had become much more open with one another. Um, and then the last piece that was really, really central to our process that continues is pretty much consensus decision-making, you know, which is not something that we had had in the past. And again, this was organic um, as this evolved. So, um, as you can imagine, and you know, it is, it is um, relative. There are still things that I make decisions about, but most of our public, you know, most of our work for public consumption is consensus. Um, and as you might imagine, boy, does this slow things down considerably. <laughs> um, so I am gonna share my screen now. And I wanna, um, show you um, a couple of examples of um, from this uh, from this exhibition. So hold on one sec. Okay, I am gonna share my screen. Oops, sorry. I appreciate your patience. Okay. Are you seeing it? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay, great. So um, what I would ask of you all, if you want to just look at the, um, look at the image, look at the artwork, and I am going to read the labels to you so you don't have to read them at the same time. Um, oops, sorry about that. Hold on. Okay, so um, the first one, and you know, as I said, these were by various different um, staff members. So this one was written by Steph Glock, who was our business manager. And some of these had to do with the pandemic and some of them had to do with racism. Um, you know, others had to do with the environment. There were a number of issues that we took on. So this was a, um, a pop art era painting by Ernst Benker titled Half Inch Grid from 62. And Steph wrote, this painting reminds me of a maze, which is exactly how this time in history feels to me. We are navigating <clears throat> uncharted territory in so many ways. The pandemic, new ways of socializing online and distanced in person, white people understanding the concept of systemic racism, remote learning, remote working, medical fragility, to name a few. I don't see a clear exit point. I see a lot of ways to work around the barriers that may work for a period of time, but those improvised paths mostly lead to more barriers, which is a metaphor to me for how life feels right now. 
And then the second one I wanna share with you was written by Cynthia Cagle, who, was our, who is our guest services coordinator um, with a photograph by Manuel Alvarez Bravo of Margarita de Bonampak from 77. As someone of Native American descent, I have an immediate and undeniable response to this photograph. There's comforting familiarity. Her face evokes friends and family from Los Angeles. There's also a sense of sadness and yearning because I'm keenly aware of how few people here in the Northeast look like her. The subject, most likely from one of Mexico's indigenous groups, is daring you to look back at her. Often pictures of native people have a kind of tokenism to them, like, like curiously exotic displays that allow white viewers the comfort of objective analysis. Not this photo, she's staring the viewer down, demanding we reckon with prejudice and privilege. And then the last one I want to share was written by Alice Boone, who is our curator of education and public programs. And I want to mention Alice is the staff member who had the experience from the Art Institute of Chicago in dealing with and addressing anti-racism within museums. So um, this is a James Stanton Abbott photograph of a sculpture group called um, Lamentations Group by Judith Brown. This is currently on the UVM campus, but what you're seeing here was on the artist property in, um, in Reading, Vermont. <clears throat> Excuse me. And Alice writes, sculptor Judith Brown drew inspiration from choreographer Martha Graham's modern dance Lamentations. Brown welded sculptural assemblages of scrap metal, oil cans, car parts, corrugated roofing materials. They were installed on the green in 1993 after Brown's death. Then they began to rust and fall apart from what conservatives call inherent vice until the black metal nearly looked like black lace. Jeffrey Sass, who had been Brown's studio assistant and had helped make the figures years earlier, took them back in to refashion them with new pieces. We will become these figures this fall as we choreograph ourselves to proceed, but distantly as carefully as we can. Our lamentations will multiply. We will assemble and reassemble our grief out of what scraps are at hand. We will need care as we fall apart from people we trust to put us back together. So as you can see, it's, you know, they're kind of a combination of personal experience, um, poetry, there's some history um, and, you know, and they deal with real issues. So this was a, a very different approach to exhibitions, um, you know, than, than we had taken in the past. So um, during the fall of 20 and winter of 21, which is when this exhibition was up, we focused on laying out our intentions to become an anti-racist museum and just began to discuss how we would accomplish this. So the process followed what we had established in the preceding months. We had two meetings a week. Um, we were working on a document that laid out our intentions and our vision. And again, um, I, you know, I guess I would say our work became harder and harder as we went. So the document that I'm going to share with you in a minute, um, you know, we had a lot of frustrations, we had enormous breakthroughs, we wrote, we edited, we rewrote, and then ultimately by the spring of 21, we posted um, a document on our website that you will see here, hold on one sec. Um, called Fleming Reimagined. And so this is really, um, Fleming Reimagine is really the, the title of the entire project um, at the museum and, and this document. Um, so there are three pillars to the document, building trust, maintaining transparency and becoming a responsive space. So the first one, um, building trust um, is, is really about, um, I'm sorry, is this that I think I'm on the second one here, hold on. Yeah, building trust. So it's about forming and nurturing relationships on campus and in the community um, with people who have felt excluded from the Fleming and people who have actually been excluded from the Fleming in the past 
Um, but above all, it's really about listening, about listening to people, about stopping constantly talking, which is what museums do, and beginning to listen. So, and we, we can share this document in the chat. So if you're interested in looking at it later, you can. It's also on the Fleming Museum's website as well. Um, so the second pillar of it is about maintaining transparency. So documenting and, and reflecting our efforts on our way to becoming an anti-racist organization. And this is about being honest about the Fleming's history, being public about it, and making public the work that we're doing, including the mistakes that we're doing, holding ourselves accountable for the mistakes as we go. This is a tough one. <laughs> Um, and then the last one is becoming a responsive space. And this is acting on what we hear, not just listening kind of performatively, but actually taking action based on what we hear, um, involving others in our decision-making, and then sharing our resources, which is something that I will talk about more as we go on. So in the summer of summer and fall of 21, um, we had come a distance with our work internally. And we had gotten to the point where we were comfortable reaching out to BIPOC communities. And I'm gonna use the term BIPOC, which I'm sure you're familiar with, but it stands for Black, Indigenous, and People of Color. Um, and it's used a lot on college campuses um, and elsewhere. But um, so we, we began to reach out, not just um, to individuals and groups that we had not known, but to people that we had known, um, you know, that we have relationships with on campus, but wanted to do our own work before reaching out to them and saying, here's what we're doing, you know, we would love to talk to you about this. Um, we reached out to, um, an amazing woman in the community who you see here on the left, Fareen Paris Meyer, who um, is a, she's a storyteller, she's a community builder, and in general just attracts people to her and is able to essentially lead people into change and through change. So um, she did a number of things with us in the summer and fall, this past summer and fall. One of the things she did was to hold affinity groups. So affinity groups are group of, groups of exclusively BIPOC um, individuals or exclusively you know, museum professionals. It's, it is not a mixed group. It is a group where um, those who wanna talk about difficult things can do that among themselves. So she held a number of groups of, a number of meetings of groups of um, BIPOC creative members of Burlington's community of color, really to talk about the role of art in their lives and to talk about the role that the museum may have played or not played um, in their lives and what role they might envision it playing in the future. Um, she also, at the end of her work with us, she held a large storytelling event um, with a number of, of storytellers who talked about their lives, talked about their experiences. And I have to say, after decades at the Fleming, this was easily, um, if not the most, one of the most moving and um, emotional and rich evenings I have ever spent in this marble court right here. So, um, through Farine's work and through our own work, we formed relationships, we nurtured existing relationships, um, and we really sought to bring new voices in to the museum to think with us. And ultimately the goal is to make, to really be involved in decision-making with us about the museum's future. So about exhibitions, about collections, about what we acquire, about what we deaccession. Um, and, you know, and how we exhibit some of the collections that are, that are problematic. Um, so, um, okay, do we want to stop right now and, and I see a question? Or actually, let me, let me, um, 
Let me just carry on very briefly here. Um, and then I want to stop and answer, answer a question that's come in. Um, so actually, you know what, let's stop now. And um, I am happy to answer a, a question that was posted about how conversations were structured without a facilitator early on. So I think this is a really good question because I know a lot of organizations of predominantly white, you know, white institutions and organizations immediately reached out to consultants, to facilitators. Um, we didn't because, as I said, it started very organically and emotionally as this group of staff members talked to each other, period. Um, we ultimately, as we got in, and I have to say, because one of our staff group had experience, and she had not been a facilitator in the past. She had been a part of a group talking about anti-racism. Um, she happened to be a teacher. So she has our education program. She has a master's in English. Um, I'm sorry, a PhD in English from Columbia and had taught quite a bit. So she was incredibly effective. And then we would each take turns. We actually, you know, we rotated facilitating. Um, and it, it worked, you know, it got us where we wanted to be. It was not easy. There were times when we thought we needed to bring in someone, um, but it got us to the point where we felt comfortable then reaching out to a, you know, to a community-based consultant, to Farine, and bringing her in. But we did not want to do that until we had reached a certain point with our work. So, you know, I think it was, in a way, it was kind of a confluence of how it how it started and the individuals who were involved in the conversation. So does that, does that answer it a little? Okay. Um, <clears throat> so, <clears throat> excuse me, in the fall of 21, last fall, we then presented a full suite of exhibitions for the first time since the museum had closed in March of 20. Um, and these are our exhibitions that we created in the same way that we had created Reckonings. So one of these exhibitions looked at the Fleming's past. This was on the second floor in our European American gallery that you're looking at right now. And then the other two were on the first floor and they really laid out how we were seeing our future or you know, some of the ways that we wanted to invite people to think about our future with us. So starting with the one that looked back, um, this was called Markers of Absence, Seeing and Unseeing the Fleming's Collection. So this took place in our European American gallery um, and in other sites throughout the museum. But the European American gallery was still firmly um, firmly embedded in the colonialist framework. You know, this was a, the group, among the group of paintings and sculptures that had come into the Fleming decades and decades ago. Um, and so we, what we did was install large labels, um, several of them, like five of them in this gallery and then several in other spaces in the museum where we had removed artworks or in one case, deinstalled a gallery, our gallery of um, ancient Egyptian and African art we had closed. Um, so some of these pieces had been on view for decades and the subject matter or the background of the artwork was really hurtful to members of the community. Um, we were no longer comfortable with them on the wall. So instead of immediately refilling these spaces with work by BIPOC artists or with other work, um, what we did was to fill them with these uh, with these large labels, again, written by individual staff members and signed by that staff, staff member, written from a personal perspective, um, you know, with real, really, you know, with our thinking about why we we're doing what we we're doing. Um, and so these served really as intentional signs of the museum's commitment to further transformation um, and to holding ourselves accountable. 
So um, I want to read you the one that you're looking at. This was the introduction to the absence project. And, it, and, and this introduction was in the entrance to the European American Gallery. So I wrote this one because I was the one who actually installed the European American Gallery 20 years earlier <laughs> as curator. So um, absence, seeing and unseeing the Fleming's collection. And it reads, in 2020, we began to dismantle the European American Gallery in a transparent and public process as part of the Fleming Reimagined. This fall, that was that fall, you will see changes that have taken place in the past year as Fleming staff, I'm sorry, it was this past fall, as Fleming staff together with UVM faculty and students have begun to reckon with the Fleming's institutional and collections history. We make our work visible in this gallery and elsewhere in the museum through our absences project as we confront the problematic histories behind the collections and with your input, rethink what we collect and how we display it and the words that accompany it. On a profound level, the Fleming's history, its collections and its white curatorial perspectives over the past 90 years have perpetuated the legacy of white supremacy established by the Fleming's first director and curator, a biologist who founded the Eugenic Survey of Vermont. The Fleming's European and American art collection and its display in this gallery focus overwhelmingly on the work of white male artists depicting white subjects, their possessions, histories, and mythologies. The racism and colonialism that shaped the museum remained embedded in our permanent collection and in the ways we have continued to present the collection in our galleries. We look forward to continuing this public reckoning and we invite your participation as we ask questions to help reimagine the Fleming Museum. What values ought to be displayed? What should we collect and exhibit? What stories about artworks do you want to hear? From what perspectives and in whose voices? Janie Cohen, director, and then in parentheses, organized this gallery in 2000 as curator. Um, so this was, um, this was, as I'll talk when I get to um, the responses, I think this was probably, this was definitely the most difficult one um, for some people to understand. I'll put that in a larger context when I talk about response because in general, um, the response has been very, very uh, positive. But this one was a little tougher for some people. Um, I think, you know, our directness in dealing with it, I think a lot of people are still kind of, a lot of white Americans at that point were uncomfortable and may still become uncomfortable about um, you know, seeing this kind of language and being included in white, you know, in, in the, you know, the um, actions of white America. But um, it has been a, it has been a pretty powerful um, project and it continues and we are adding to the labels as well. So um, the other two exhibitions um, on the first floor are both, as I mentioned, really looking to the future. Both of them focused on artwork by Black, Indigenous, and, and artists of color. A lot of these were brand new acquisitions, um, especially in this gallery. And this was called the Storytelling Salon, Voices Creating Change. Um, so this space, which looks like a living room. We had never done this. We had always in every installation focused on the artwork. One of the huge changes in this work that we're doing now is that we are focusing on people and conversations through the artwork. And that is crystal clear if you look at this gallery. It invites you to come in and sit down. Um, and it, it, it has been very, very effective. Um, the, the naming of it, the Storytelling Salon, we had talked with the Reckonings exhibition about how we really are using art to tell stories about our emotions and our experiences in response to collective 
um, you know, collective trauma in response to the pandemic in response to addressing racism in America. So for this show, we updated some of the labels from the reckoning show from the prior year with new stories that in part reflected some of the things we had learned. And then we added new works that were primarily new acquisitions that um, really help us think about the power of storytelling in enacting change. And we did this in part in with Farine, in talking through and thinking through these things with Farine. So we described the gallery and, and this exhibition this way. The Storytelling Salon is a space to gather ideas about what new kinds of stories can be told in the museum, to prioritize sharing multiple perspectives, to decenter the museum's authority and hold space for new voices. So the space was used for um, a number of things, but um, Marine used it for affinity group meetings. So she had organized groups of primarily black um, and indigenous um, UVM students and faculty and members of the community um, and, and creative members of the community. And it was also used for, for UVM, small UVM class discussions for community groups who wanted to meet at the Fleming. And when I mentioned before, kind of sharing our resources, this is something that we became very, very aware of, which is that rather than, you know, in looking at populations or groups of people who may not have felt the museum had any meaning for them or, or any purpose, uh, you know, we basically said our spaces are available for your use, you know, for what you want to do and consider important. So we had, I mean, this space, for instance, was used by, a, um, by an incredible group, uh, an, another museum, Black Run Museum that focuses in Burlington or in Charlotte, Vermont, that focuses on um, the longest held black owned farm in in um, in northern New England. So they're doing a lot of work on their organization and they met here. So it wasn't so much we have a program, come see our program, but here are resources, you know, here's space, come use it when you want. Um, here's just another view on that one. And then the the other um, gallery on the first floor, that was also experimenting with and looking towards how we might um, create conversations and work with museum visitors and students in the future. We called it Learning Studio, Creating Conversations with Art. So um, this one, again, had a, a number of new acquisitions by Black and Indigenous artists and artists of color. Um, one of these you see on the left, Howardina Pindell, and this was actually a landscape. This is a river, a print that she made at an artist's residency in northern Vermont. And one of some of my staff members came up with quotes and triggers for conversation and for thinking. So we had a large quote above that in the wall, in water, in rivers, movement creates change. How will your movement through the world create the change you want to see? So, you know, metaphor is a large part of art and we use metaphor in talking about change, talking about, um, you know, about transformation. The other thing that we did with this gallery, which was um, just, it turned out to be an incredible gift, um, was that we, we really made it, it was half gallery, half learning space. So in part out of necessity, <laughs> Um, we needed a large teaching area where we could um, we could collect, you know, where classes could meet, where they could social distance. So we don't have a teaching gallery, um, or we did not at that time have a teaching gallery. And our curatorial team and our education team would meet with classes and other people wherever, you know, worked, wherever the exhibition was, wherever there wasn't another group of people. So in this case, we really needed to create a space where we could have classes, um, but at the same time, welcome the public. 
So with this space, we not only had more classes than we had ever had in the Fleming during the course of a semester, it was really, it's been nonstop, but we um, established a new part-time position, which the person sat in this, this chair right here and interface with the public and made sure that they knew that they were welcome to listen and to, you know, to listen to the teaching and learning that was happening with um, my staff and UVM faculty and to look at the artwork that was on the, you know, on the shelves on the wall or on the tables. Um, this was brand new for our visitors and the members of the public loved it. They also actually, um, saw more work from the collection than they ever had before because for classes we take things out of storage constantly every single day so every day there were different works down here and so some members of the public just started coming back because they knew what they would be seeing the work day after day um so just to kind of interject one um you know one kind of response and um you know response that we had gotten about uh, there were literally like three people who had who had raised the issue of well you know if you take something off the wall how can you learn from it um you know the issues there is that if the thing that was on the wall is hurtful it is not that that's not worth creating a learning moment you take it off the wall and you talk about it which is what we had done with the absence labels um, but, you know, at, at one point someone said, well, we'll see less art. And the fact is, because of this space, people were seeing so much more work from the collection than they had ever seen before, which, you know, ended up being so exciting for everybody. So um, the other thing that happened in this space that we had um, this wonderful new staff member who was in the space interacting with the public, but during cor the course of the workday, my staff members and I would all just kind of gravitate to the space because it was so gratifying and exciting to be in it and to be interacting with the public and with with students in that way so um it was really um you know this was a such a so much more than we thought it would be and here's a, a picture of our curator um with a group of of students in that space and that is if for the slideshow, there's a few um, closing thoughts that I want to share. Um, and I actually do want to, I want to talk a little bit more about response. Um, so by and large, it was very, very positive. There were two ways that response came to us, um, actually more. One through our website, um, we had guest books in the museum, and we had an enormous amount of media media attention and media focus on what we were doing. So there were a couple letters to the editor and I, I do think they were all together about three. Um, and again, about the absences project. And, and that was really the only place where we received any kind of pushback, which is pretty phenomenal. Um, and, you know, we did engage it. You know, we had conversations with people on site about, you know, why we took down X painting, et cetera. Um, so, you know, we are, we are asking, still asking questions through our website, through um, focus groups, through conversations, um, getting feedback on it. And again, strengthening our relationships um, with a wide range of people as we go and as we make further decisions about what we're doing, we're continuing to build relationships and to, you know, and to strengthen some of the ones that we have. Um, we are currently installing two new exhibitions for the spring, one uh, by an artist named Mohammed Hafez, who is based in New Haven, Connecticut, um, who is a refugee from Syria. And it is about the refugee experience. So we are working with, community groups on um, inviting people in before we open to give them kind of previews of the exhibition with the artist. The other show that we're doing, which is very exciting as well, um, is a, a community-based artist, Chantal B. Gander, um, who has a series called Dark Goddess of photographs of some of her friends and colleagues and all African-American women. And it is, the subtitle is um, 
examination or exploration into the sacred feminine. She is also curating some objects from our collection, which is, I am very excited about that aspect as well. So, you know, as I said, we, the, 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 um, the goal is to include other people than just the funding staff in our decision making about exhibitions, about what we buy, about what we show, etc. Um, we are working on issues of repatriation, and I haven't talked about this at all, but um, we are working with other museums international on internationally on probably returning the Benin bronze head from um, the Benin kingdom that was sacked in the 1860s by the Brits. Um, this was that there was an image of one of these, not the Flemings, but of one of these Benin bronze heads on the flyer for this talk. Um, this is a, you know, it's an effort that's happening um, countrywide, or I'm sorry, uh, worldwide. But this also reminded me that um, in, in the area of responses, some of the UVM students are even ahead of us and are pushing us, you know, and their feeling is that we're not moving quickly enough on the Benin bronze return. So, you know, you've got these kind of poles and, and a spectrum, you know, a scale all the way along the way of where people are with regard to what we're doing. But we are um, loving working with the students. Um, so the other thing, and this is the last thing um, I am going to uh, include, and then we can go to some questions, um, is that we are also working on advisory councils and advisory groups at a lot of different levels. So our first one is going to be meeting in the coming week or two, and it is an advisory council on that looks at our indigenous collection of native of Native American, um, indigenous collection of American artifacts. And again, what we're looking at with them, and this is faculty and students and um, artists actually, and mostly Native, not entirely, some, of, some um, non from the UVM faculty. We're looking at repatriation of some objects. We're looking at how we exhibit them, how we use them in teaching. Um, and, what we're acquiring. So, um, you know, there are a lot of different aspects that we're asking them to think with us on. So I'm gonna stop there and I've gotten a few more questions here. Um, uh, is there any work being done in collaboration with art, art history, anthropology students, um, departments and students? Yes, absolutely. So one of the things that, um, that we are most proud of is the classes that come to the Fleming to learn from and teach from our collection are really campus wide. And, you know, it's one would assume that it's art and art history and anthropology and history and maybe English, but it really is. I mean, it's the College of Medicine. It's the School of Nursing. Um, you know, it, it is the Rubenstein School for the Environment. It is absolutely across campus. And the uses of the collection are limited only by our imaginations. And the faculty have gotten so good at really thinking about how they can use our collection in teaching. Um, so we do, but we have, we have various kinds of collaborations with a lot of different departments and a lot of different kinds of collaborations. Um, so, you know, some of these are exhibitions, some are programmatic. Um, one like with the, with the uh, Rubenstein School for the Environment, every semester they bring in 80 students to, to spend the day with the collections, um, you know, the co aspects of the collections that deal with the environment. So um, we're really, and anthropology is, we're actually, what we want to do with them soon is to really get kind of a group of anthro faculty and students together with my staff to talk about how, um, how our fields are responding to anti-racism because they're, you know, and colonialism because their uh, anthropology is dealing with a lot of the same issues that museums are. So I thought it'd be really, you know, really helpful. Um, so here is a really excellent question um, that, and, and Karen, thank you for asking this again. In a, in a prior conversation, we had touched on this, and this is a really, really 
Um, it's a really complex one. How, what is my understanding of the kind of the difference between cultural appreciation and cultural appropriation? Um, so this is tough. And, um, you know, this happens at every level of, um, you know, this happens within artists' work. I make artwork and this happens within my own work. Um, and, you know, I was doing things that I felt, um, you know, I was using fabric, using cloth from other countries and other cultures. And I have come up against this in my work. I'm still doing it, but I'm contextualizing it. This goes all the way to, um, I'll give you an example within museums, which I consider one of the really one of the you know most most difficult, which is um, exhibitions about culture X curated by culture Y. So an exhibition of um, indigenous, you know, North American indigenous artists' work curated by a white curator, and you know it's not it's not that it shouldn't be done, but there are so many aspects to the conversations and to the process, to the level of trust that's necessary to do a really strong show that I think one has to be very, very careful with it. Um, and at this point, you know, we are really preferring exhibitions that are curated, you know, about a culture that are curated by um, people within the culture. And there is a, a saying about that that is essentially nothing about us without us. So in other words, don't do any, don't create anything about us without us, without including us. Um, and I think that is a really good, you know, good kind of rule to go by. Um, and, you know, there are many situations in which we think that what we're doing is appreciation, but if we, if we dig a little deeper, we realize that, you know, that we're not including the voices that we really need to include. Um, so another question was, how have other museums reacted to our initiative? So this has been interesting. I'm glad this was asked as well, because I really want to make clear that we are not alone in doing this. And we were so not the first, you know, as I said at the beginning, we did not start this until May 26, 2020. Um, but because of the way we did it, um, we have kind of gotten deeper into it than a lot of other museums have. Um, part, of, part of what we're doing that not a lot of other ones are doing, and I think this is because A, we are a small museum, um, B, possibly, you know, my experience in museums where I am in my career, my level of comfort, my trust of my staff, um, our level of consensus decision making is a lot further than most museums is. Um, we have also, I think, in terms of the way that we talk on our labels, the kind of the level of honesty um, is also a little more than you do see in some. There's still more objectivity and kind of more of a historical element. So there are a number of museums like the Rijksmuseum in Amsterdam and the Worcester Museum in Massachusetts um, are both doing projects where they have additional labels that talk about um, how many enslaved people the sitter for this portrait helped, how many slaves they had, you know, and it's all, you know, it is all um, historical material, whereas we are again trying to bring more emotion, trying to bring more personal, um, you know, personal thinking and personal reflection into the labels that we're writing. Um, so I, there are a couple things that, um, let me just quickly look at, um, okay, one other qu question. Um, what, what are the key factors in the decision to remove previously exhibited work? So um, I can give you some examples. One of the paintings that we removed that had been hanging for so long um, was by a 19th century white Europe, uh, American artist named Thomas Hovenden. 
And um, it was of a black man seated in his kitchen. And this was a model that this painter had used, had painted a lot. And until about 15 years ago or so, it really had been viewed by most white historians as um, respectful. And as you know, the word that was used over and over again was this man looks so dignified. Well, if you, again, if you dig a little deeper, there were numerous things about that painting that were actually racist stereotypes that came out of the history of minstrelsy. Um, and so, you know, what I wrote a label about that, since I was the one that hung that in the African, in the European American gallery um, 20 years ago, I wrote the label about that, that talked about, um, you know, about the historical precedents, you know, the historical components of it um, that made it racist, even though it looked like a respectful painting portrait. Um, and then I also, you know, included my own feelings about doing this, that, um, you know, the fact that I, as a white curator and now director, had left this, you know, stereotype on the wall for, you know, for so many years unquestioned. So, you know, what we're doing is it's, it's somewhat in your face and it's, you know, it's intentionally, I think, um, you know, it was uncomfortable for us and I think it's uncomfortable for some people to read it, but um, I wanted to end with what I think are the most important things that tie directly into this, and there are just a couple of them. Um, one is to be willing to make mistakes, to go back and try again, because you will make mistakes. Um, it's an iterative process. It sometimes feels like one step forward, two steps back. And being willing to accept responsibility for things that um, that one did not cause directly, but one also hasn't sought to change. And that for me, I mean, I've been in this museum for a long time and I feel very responsible for how it has been, um, you know, which is why I feel so strongly about how it has to change. And um, I think to do the things that we've done and, you know, and to continue doing them, it's really important to be able to move beyond what's called white fragility. And that is really kind of the guilt, the shame, the denial, you know, a whole host of other um, emotions that we, and I say we as white Americans feel about racism in America. Um, and it's not, you know, it isn't easy and it isn't comfortable, but I know that, you know, without doing that, we would not be at the point where we are now with this and we wouldn't be able to move forward, um, you know, which is our hope and our plan. So I wanna thank you all um, very much for being here. And I'm 